أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أظلم ممن افترى على الله كذبا أو قال أوحي إلي ولم يوح إليه شيء ومن قال سأنزل مثل ما أنزل الله وترى إذ الظالمون في غمرات الموت والملائكة باسط أيديهم أخرجوا أنفسكم اليوم تجزون عذاب الهون بما كنتم تقولون على الله غير الحق وكنتم عن آياته تستكبرون صدق الله العلي العظيم عطر أفواهكم وزين مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى in verse 93 of Surah Al-An'am, he says, And who is more wicked than one who fabricates a lie against God? Or says, It has been revealed to me, while nothing has been revealed to him. And one who says, I will reveal the like of what God has revealed. And if you could but see when the wicked are in the overwhelming pangs of death, while the angels extend their hands, saying, Discharge your souls. Today you will be awarded the punishment of humiliation for what you used to say against God other than the truth, and you were towards his signs being arrogant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many verses in the Quran, he poses this rhetorical question to the disbelievers. And this is a rhetorical question that is a common Quranic criticism that is directed towards the community of disbelievers. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially asks, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who is more wicked than the one who fabricates a lie against God? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions three groups under the general category of being the most wicked of people. So there are three groups that are mentioned as being the most wicked. And you'll find that there is one crime that all of them share. The first is, iftara ala Allahi kathiba. The first is the one who forges a lie against God who attributes something falsely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who distorts the truth, who makes false assertions about divine revelation. So this is number one, fabricating a lie against God. Number two, The second group are those who make false claims to being recipients of revelation people who falsely claim to be prophets, individuals who falsely claim to hold div, uh, positions that are only divinely appointed. And number three is the one who says, سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ Allah. The one who claims to have the ability to compose something similar to divine revelation who claims that they're able to create something that is equally beautiful, equally elegant to divine speech. Now, these three, distortion of truth, 
claiming to be a recipient of revelation, essentially claiming to possess divine authority and to belittle revelation by saying that human beings are capable of producing the like. These three groups, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them the most wicked of people. Women of them, who is more wicked than these three? And you find that what these three have in common, because to be the most wicked, it can only be one. You cannot have multiple groups being the most wicked. So what connects these three groups, the underlying crime that all of these three groups commit is they actively misguide others. You see, it's one thing to be a deviant, but it's a whole nother crime when you actively try to misguide others. So someone who's distorting the truth, someone who's fabricating a lie against God, not only do they commit a sin, but they potentially misguide the masses. When someone claims, when someone falsely claims to be a recipient of revelation or to be in power by divine right, not only are they committing a sin, but they're also potentially jeopardizing the masses. They're misguiding and misleading the masses. And for someone to say that I can produce something that matches the beauty and the eloquence and the, the mastery of, the linguistic mastery of divine speech, by belittling divine speech, you're pushing people away from the truth. So in the Quran, the most wicked person is the one who deprives himself and also who deprives others of guidance. This is even worse than murder in some cases. Because when you murder a human being, you've annihilated their physical existence. But when you deprive people of guidance, when you bar them from the avenues that lead them to the truth, you deprive them of prosperity in this life and even potentially in the hereafter. So these three groups are connected together because they share in the crime of misguiding others, depriving others of the truth. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَوْ قَالَ أُوْحِيَ إِلَيَّ وَلَمْ يُوْحَ إِلَيْهِ شَيْءٍ وَمَنْ قَالَ سَأُنْزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهِ It's interesting that when you look at these verses, we have a collection of traditions from the Ahlul Bayt where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam they, they apply this verse to certain individuals in Islamic history. For example, we have a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi where he says, this ayah applies, he says, الإمام, that the ayah that says, the part of the verse that says, one of the, the most wicked of people is the one who claims to be a recipient of revelation, who says it has been revealed to me while they have not received any revelation. The Imam alayhi salam, he says this verse also applies to the one who falsely claims to be an Imam when they have not been appointed as an Imam. Those who came after, came to power after the death of the Holy Prophet, who claim to be the successors of the Holy Prophet, this verse also applies to them because they're assuming a position that can only be occupied by divine appointment. The Imam says the one who claims to be an Imam, falsely claims to be an Imam, is also included in this verse. Imam al Sadiq he also says that this verse is also a reference to the likes of Muawiyah and Bani Umayyah. 
The Imam alayhi salam, he says, نَزَلَتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ Verse number 93 of Surah Al-An'am, the interpretation was revealed in reference to Mu'awiyah wa Bani Umayyah wa shuraka'ihim wa immatihim. This verse is a reference to the likes of Mu'awiyah, Bani Umayyah, and their aides and their the scholars that supported them because they distorted fact. They distorted the truth. They adulterated religious interpretation. They also had scholars who fabricated traditions. You know, there was a, a hadith that I was reading today, and it's a hadith from Abu Huraira. And this is an actual hadith. I'm not making this up. This is an actual hadith from Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira says, and here I'm giving you an example of distortion of fact, fabrication of, you know, uh, fabricating lies against God and his messenger. Abu Huraira says that Rasulullah says, so Abu Huraira is reporting that the Holy Prophet allegedly said, Verily, Allah entrusted three people with his revelation. Myself, Rasulullah is speaking. Three have been entrusted with divine revelation. Rasulullah says, myself, Jibra'il, and Mu'awiyah. And Mu'awiyah. Yes, this is a hadith. Imam al-Sadiq says, this verse applies to the likes of Mu'awiyah and Bani Umayyah because they fabricated lies against God. How many Muslims today have never been exposed to Dua Kumay, Sahif al sajjadiyya who have no knowledge of the Islam of Ahlul Bayt because of these lies that were fabricated. How many people today have never heard of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam al Hussein, Imam Jafar al Sadiq around the world because certain individuals claimed to have a right to the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Isn't this the most wicked crime? Because you've deprived humanity of proper guidance. They missed out on an opportunity to live prosperously in this dunya and potentially the akhirah. There's another hadith where the Imam alayhi salam, especially the part where the claim is made, in the ayah where the third amongst the group that is called the most wicked is the one who says وَمَنْ قَالَ سَأُنزِلُ مِثْلَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ that I am that I will reveal the like of what God has revealed basically belittling revelation saying that I can produce what God is revealing Imam Jafar al-Sadiq he says that this part of the ayah is a reference to one of the companions of the Holy Prophet but by the name of Ibn Abi Sarh who was later after the death of the Holy Prophet who was appointed as one of the governors of Egypt during the time of Uthman. This man Ibn Abi Sarh was one of the scribes of revelation. Apparently the Holy Prophet had appointed a number of companions who would record the Quran as it was revealed. He would dictate to them the verses that were revealed and they would record it. Ali ibn Abi Talib was among them, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, if I remember correctly, and it seems that for a time, Ibn Abi Sarh was one of them. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, فَإِذَا أَنزَلَ Allah." He says, this man, this companion of the Prophet, when Allah would reveal a verse, and the verse would conclude for example with in the laha azizun hakim that the ayah would end with verily allah is the the, the almighty and the all wise kataba in the laha alimun hakim ibn abi sarh would modify the ayah instead of in the laha azizun hakim he would change it to in the laha alimun hakim 
he would change Aziz to Alim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Imam says, فَيَقُولُ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ would say, Da'ha, do not write Alim. Even though Allah is Alim, no one is denying that Allah is the All-Knowing. But it was revealed, Al-Aziz, Azizun Hakim. So Ibn Abi Sarh, he felt that he had the authority to make these minor changes because to him, it doesn't affect the, the message of the ayah. And to him, perhaps it sounded better if he wrote Alimun Hakim as opposed to Azizun Hakim. So when the Prophet would rebuke him for essentially changing parts of the ayah, Ibn Abi Sarh would complain to the munafiqeen, to the hypocrites. He would say to them, إِنِّي لَأَقُولُ مِنْ مِثْلِ مَا يَجِيءُ بِهِ فَمَا يُغَيُّرُ عَلَيْهِ He would say to them that, why is Muhammad rebuking me? That these changes are from my own accord. And I am able to produce the likes of the Qur'an. So he's claiming that he has the ability to produce literature that matches the Holy Qur'an. Now, if you go to the end of the ayah, so the verse begins with a list of three categories of people that are deemed the most wicked of people. And they are the most wicked because they misguide others. In addition to being misguided, they actively misguide others. And then the ayah says, وَتَرَى إِذِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي غَمَرَاتِ الْمَوْتِ And if you could but see when the wicked are in the overwhelming pangs of death. Now this ayah ends with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about what will happen to these individuals when they meet their ultimate end, which is death. Ghamarat al maut Ghamarat in Arabic means the difficulties of something. There is a hadith from Amir al Mu'minin, salawatullahi alayhi, where he says, Inna lil maut la ghamarat. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, Death has difficulties. He a afba'u min an tastagrika bi sifa. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, the difficulties of death cannot possibly be articulated. Imagine, Amir al Mu'mineen, the Imam of eloquence, the master of speech and communication, the one who in the first khutbah of Nahjul Balagha describes the creation of the cosmos in meticulous detail. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, the difficulties of death cannot possibly be articulated. Imam says, furthermore, not only can death not possibly be described, the difficulties cannot possibly be described, but the minds of the people cannot even comprehend the difficulties of death. In, in Nahjul al-Balagha, in Sermon 109, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he speaks about the pangs of death. I'm going to read an excerpt from Nahjul al-Balagha for us to appreciate Ghamaratul Mawt, the difficulties of death that are being alluded to in this, in this verse. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Sermon 109, and you can refer, you can find this in Nahjul al-Balagha. He says, how unexpectedly do the pangs of death of which they knew not befall them. Death oftentimes comes unexpectedly. None of us know when we will die. No one can tell you that I will die on this day, at this hour. It comes unexpectedly. How suddenly, the Imam says, how suddenly does the separation from this world 
from which they believe themselves immune overtake them. How true, th how true is this, brothers and sisters, that although we know death is a reality, we act as though we are immune from it. We read Surah Al-Fatiha for those who have passed, but we fail to recognize that one day there will be a request from believers to, surat, to recite Surah Al-Fatiha for you and I. How suddenly does the separation from this world from which they believe themselves immune overtake them? How quickly do they proceed towards the hereafter as they had always been promised? And then the Imam says, indescribable is what befalls them. At once, the pangs of death and the remorse of lost opportunity convene upon them. As a consequence, the Imam says, their, ex their, their extremities go flaccid and their color goes pale. The Imam is speaking about the process of death. You lose your, your mobility. Then death permeates, penetrates a little more. The Imam says, such a person is barred from the faculty of speech. He lies before his family, seeing with his eyes, hearing with his ears. With the mind still sound, he wonders, what did I do with my life? How did I spend my years? He recalls wealth he amassed, in whose acquisition he was careless. You and I... We spend a lifetime accumulating money and resources. But do we ever take a moment to consider the lawfulness of our income? He recalls wealth he amassed in whose acquisition he was careless. Taking it now from both, taking it from both lawful and doubtful sources. The ill consequence of amassing it now follow him as he as he is about to bid the wealth itself farewell the wealth will remain for those who come after him who will enjoy it the saver shall be for another while the burden falls on his back you spend an entire lifetime accumulating and amassing wealth you're careless about its source what will happen? You will leave it to your inheritors to enjoy, and you will, the burden will be transferred to you. Allah will hold you accountable for the wealth that was accumulated. This man, the Imam says, pawned his soul for his wealth. Now he bites his hand in regret for the matters he must face at the time of his death. He feels indifferent to the things he longed for throughout his life. When your soul is gradually leaving your body, the things that you coveted become worthless. The money that you, that you were obsessed with, the position that you were chasing after, the things that had great allure in your eyes now are worthless in your eyes because you've realized the, tempora the, the temporary nature of this life the fleeting reality of this world. And he wishes the one who envied him, and he wishes the one who envied him and jealous of him had procured it all instead of him. And then the Imam says, death continues to increase its hold on his body until it mingles with his hearing. So when a person dies, their extremities go flaccid. They're not able to move. Then they lose their ability to speak, the Imam says. After losing their ability to speak, they start to lose their ability to hear. So he is left before his family, neither able to speak with his tongue nor hear with his ears. He shifts his eyes, looking at their faces. He sees the movement of their lips but he does not understand the intent of their speech. So he's lost his ability to move. He's lost his ability to speak. And he's losing his ability to, his ability to hear all. He, the only faculty that's remaining is his faculty of sight. He's able to see. 
and he's shifting his eyes, glancing at their faces. Then death, the Imam says, permeates him more. His sight is taken as his hearing had been taken. His spirit leaves his body and he becomes but a corpse before his family. Now they have fled his side in terror and distanced themselves from him. He cannot help him who mourns for him, nor can he answer him who calls for him. Then they carry him to a ditch in the ground and relinquish their, him therein to his deeds and cease to visit him. The same family that would hug you and kiss you and embrace you, the moment that your soul leaves your body, all of a sudden everyone is afraid to come near you. And they carry you to this ditch in the ground. And as I mentioned before, even the mother does not remain with her child. They may cry, they may weep, they may mourn for hours over your grave. Their tears may soak the soil on your grave. But eventually they will leave and the moisture of their tears will dry and you will be left alone. And there will come a day when those visits become very infrequent and they completely cease to visit you. This is what the ayah is describing. Allah tells the Prophet that these people who are an obstacle to the truth, who were the reason why many generations were misguided, if you were only to see them, in their last moments, when they experience these difficulties, the difficulties of death. And then the ayah says, well, malaikatu basitu aidihim. There, The angels have their hands extended. Now some scholars, they say the angels have their hands extended because they're prepared to violently extract the soul. Other scholars say that these are a reference to the angels that strike and beat this individual upon, upon transferring to Alam al Akhirah. This is how the angels welcome these individuals into the hereafter. If you go to Surah Al Anfal, Surah 8, verse 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how the angels receive the kuffar when they enter into alam al akhir when they die, when their souls leave their body. Allah says in ayah number 50 of Surah Al-Anfal, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ يَتَوَفَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا If you were only to see the disbelievers when, they, when their lives are terminated, the angels are striking their faces and their backsides. They're being hit by the angels. And they are told by the angels, taste the blazing fire. Then the ayah concludes with the angel saying, Akhriju and Fusakum, discharge your souls. Now, of course, the human being doesn't have the power to release his own soul. This is a way, this is the way in which the angels mock the disbelievers. In the same way, when someone is given the death penalty, if someone shouts at this person who's being executed, die. This is the angels essentially telling them that die, give up your souls, because we're waiting to receive you on the other end. And then the malaika, they say to these individuals, the angels will say, so in addition to extracting their souls, the angels have an announcement to make to these individuals. They will say to them, today you will be awarded 
the punishment of humiliation. Why? For what you used to say against God other than the truth. This is the punishment for fabricating lies against God, for tampering with religion, for adulterating religious text, for misconstruing religious interpretation. So this is number one. And you were towards his signs being arrogant. This is the punishment for distortion of truth and arrogance. And arrogance seems to be the root of these sins. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in a hadith, and I'll read just the English for the sake of time. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he speaks about the danger of arrogance. He says, Allah tests his servants with many different hardships. He makes them engage in different struggles and he makes them undergo multiple misfortunes. If you look at the life of any human being, our lives are surrounded by trial and tribulation, difficulties and mishaps. The Imam says all of this is in order to extract arrogance from their hearts. It seems that this dunya, that if you experience it with a reflective mind, if you're an introspective person, that when you ponder over the trials and tribulations of life, these difficulties are meant to extract arrogance from your heart. Imam says all this in order to extract arrogance from their hearts to establish humbleness. These individuals are being punished for their arrogance. If in the Akhara arrogance is punished, humility is rewarded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to be humble because when you're humble, you're more likely to submit to the truth. One of the main reasons why human beings reject revelation, they become, they, they develop adversarial relations, relationships with prophets and messengers, it's because of their arrogance. The Imam says, Allah put you through these difficulties to eradicate the arrogance from the hearts and to establish humbleness and to make them open the doors to His grace. If you want to expose yourself to divine grace, it only happens when you are humble, when you develop and instead you foster a sense of humility. So this was, this was the long verse of ayah number 93. Ayah number 94. وَتَرَكْتُمْ مَا خَوَّلْنَاكُمْ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِكُمْ وَمَا نَرَى مَعَكُمْ شُفَعَاءَكُمْ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّهُمْ فِيكُمْ شُرَكَاءَ لَقَدْ, لقد تَقَطَّعَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَضَلَّ عَنْكُمْ مَا كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ It will be said to them, and you have certainly come to us alone, as we created you the first time. And you have left whatever we bestowed upon you behind you. And we do not see with you your intercessors, which you claimed that they were among you associates of God. It has all been severed between you. And lost from you is what you used to claim. In the previous verse, the angels were making an announcement to the disbelievers. After their souls are taken, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address them. It seems that there is a divine announcement that is made when the souls are separated from the body. This is perhaps on the Day of Judgment in Alamul Barzakh. In any case, this is 
Allah addressing human beings after their souls have been separated from their bodies, after their souls are taken. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have certainly come to us alone as we created you the first time. Now, although the day of judgment is a day of universal judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges all people. All of us are standing collectively in the presence of God. Now, although the day of judgment is a day of universal judgment, interestingly, every person on the day of judgment will feel utterly alone. You know, it's amazing how on one hand, you're standing among billions or even trillions of human beings on the plane of the day of judgment. And at the same time, you experience a profound loneliness on that day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He captures that, that's, that loneliness in Surah Abasa, Surah number 80, verses 34 to 37. Allah says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ In this life, you know, we're social creatures. You have parents, you have a spouse, you have children, you have siblings. If I ask you who are, who are the most important people in your life, the most dear people to you in life, you're going to say, my mom, my dad, my spouse, my children, your direct family are probably the most important people in your life, the most precious. In this verse, Allah says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي On the day in which man will run away, يَفِرُ Not just turn away, run away from your brother, your siblings, your mother, your father, your wife, your spouse, and your children. The individuals that you are the most close to in this life, you will run away from them. You will be willing to ransom them on that day. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي Why is man turning away from his loved ones on that day? Allah answers in ayah number 37. لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِي Because everyone is preoccupied. You don't have time to think about your spouse, your parents, your children. You're trying to rescue yourself from Jahannam. It's a very serious day, brothers and sisters. When you see Jahannam, you're going to forget your mother, your father, your children. You're going to be alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asks, He says, you will return to me alone just as I created you alone. You came into this world with nothing. You didn't have clothes. You didn't have money. You had no titles. You had nothing. You were bare. And you will return to me in the same way. They are also alone. Ulama say they are also alone in the sense that they will be brought to judgment without their worldly means without their wealth you know usually when you go out you have your credit cards you have your you have money with you you have family you have you know the arabs had their tribes you have different protective mechanisms in the form of people wealth you have resources but all of that will be stripped away the only protection on that day, it's not a tribal affiliation. It's not wealth that you amassed. The only protection on that day is your amal, 
your actions, your deeds. And it's interesting in this ayah, Allah says, it has all been severed between you. Everything that you were striving for in this life, all of the wealth that you accumulated, the worldly possessions that you strive to gather, all of this will be severed from you. It will be cut off. There will be no connection between your wealth and you on the Day of Judgment. Fakhrul Razi, the prominent Sunni commentator, he has a beautiful remark here when he says, bring a beautiful comment, he says, although worldly goods are left behind, and, the, and that the connection between these goods and the one who strives to acquire them is severed, the effort one has made in acquiring knowledge of God and virtue and good deeds done in this life, by contrast, are sent forth. So on the Day of Judgment, you have things that you are cut off from, your worldly goods, but you also have things that you have sent forward. If you go to Surah 73, Verse 20, Allah says, وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ The good deeds that you have sent forward, you will find them. Your wealth, all of these material goods will be severed. You will be cut off from them. The one thing that is transferable from alamu dunya to alamu akhirah that will benefit you is your not your ma'rifah of allah the virtues the good deeds that you had accumulated in the next ayah verse number 95 allah says inna allah faliq al-hab inna allah faliq al-hab wa nawa يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَمُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتِ مِنَ الْحَيِّ ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ فَأَنَّا تُؤْفَكُونَ Indeed, God is the splitter of the grain and the fruit stone. He brings the living out of the dead and brings the dead out of the living. That is God. So how are you deluded? The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the splitter of the grain and the fruit stone is connected to his bringing forth the living from the dead in that the splitting of the grain and fruit stone causes life to come forth from something that is or is seemingly dead. You see, brothers and sisters, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about resurrection, bringing life after death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't frame the argument as this is something that will happen. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about resurrection, He says that it's constantly happening. It's not that it will happen. Everything around you is a reminder of this cycle of life and death. Allah says, I bring life from the dead and I bring dead to the living. This cycle of life and death is all around us. It's in the changing of the seasons. When you see this lifeless seed split open, Allah shows you life sprouting from something that possessed no life. So the cycle of death and life is all around us. It's something that is happening. It's not only something that will happen. There's a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq where he speaks about life and death in metaphorical terms. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, فَالْحَيُّ mu'min." He says, the living is the mu'min. الَّذِي تَخْرُجُ طِينَتُهُ 
من طينة الكافر The Imam عليه السلام he says one of the meanings of this verse where Allah says I bring life from the dead the Imam he says it's when Allah brings a mu'min from the loins of a kafir we have many examples in history of parents who are kuffar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out a righteous progeny from a kafir we have many examples of this and we have the opposite as well the Imam says وَالْمَيِّتُ الَّذِي يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الْحَيْ هُوَ الْكَافِرُ الَّذِي يَخْرُجُ مِنْ طِينَتِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِ So the dead who comes from the living is the kafir who comes from the mu'min. And the living who comes from the dead is the mu'min who comes from the kafir. For example, you have Salman al-Farisi. His father was a disbeliever. Here, a mu'min came from a kafir. And in the Quran, we have an example of a kafir who came from the loins of a mu'min. Nuh alayhi salam, a prophet of God, one of the great prophets of resolve, Ulul Az. His son was a disbeliever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I bring the living from the dead and the dead from the living. In ayah number 96, Allah says, فَالِقُ الْإِصْبَاحِ وَجَعَلَ اللَّيْلَ سَكَنًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ حُسْبَانًا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ He is the splitter of daybreak. He is the cleaver of daybreak. And has made the night for rest and the sun and moon for reckoning time. This is the measuring of the mighty and the knowing. If you notice in verses 95 and 96, there is a theme of splitting things. There is a theme of duality that you notice. In ayah number 95, the duality of life and death. In ayah number 96, the duality of Light and darkness, day and night. فَالِقُ الْإِصْبَاحِ The same Lord who splits the seed is the same Lord who splits the night with the light of darkness. When you look at the rising of the sun, it's complete darkness. That first light at dawn resembles the splitting of darkness just like the sea and the fruit stone are split and life emerges dawn is essentially the splitting of that darkness with light and light is a life-giving force and it's beautiful that when you look at if not all many of the infallibles, the Holy Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you find that when you look at their biographies, most of them, if not all of them, they are born close to the time of dawn. There's a, there's a beautiful symbolism associated with their births. That these are individuals who have been appointed to be the guides of mankind to take mankind out of darkness into light. And they are born close to the moment in which light begins to emanate from the horizon. You see there's beautiful divine planning in even the births of many of the ma'asumin. فَالِقُ الْإِصْبَاحِ Allah is the splitter of daybreak. Now, when you read this verse, you may think that light is a ni'mah, that day is a blessing. 
And you may think that night is when Allah temporarily takes away the blessing of day. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because usually night in the minds of many has negative connotations. Death, night, these are things that human beings consider negative or void of, of benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions the benefit of night. Thaliqul Isbah, we all know the benefits and the advantages of day. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning daybreak, He mentions the night. Allah has made the night for rest. You know, brothers and sisters, you may have noticed, and science has proven this, when you sleep during the day, it's not like the sleep that you get at night. The sleep at night cannot be compensated for by having a nap during the day. There are certain physiological changes that happen to your body at night. There are certain hormones that are released at night that offer you a unique type of rest that cannot be that cannot be achieved by a nap during the day. Allah says, I have made the night a time of rest. Now, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam in one of his statements, there was one of the companions of the Imam who told Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib that he was intending on traveling during the night. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam he says to him, وَلَا تَسِرْ أَوَّلَ اللَّيْلِ Do not travel in the beginning of the night. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ جَعَلَهُ سَكَنًا Because Allah has made the night a time of rest you do damage to your body when you don't rest at night and this is a very bad habit that this new generation has that we stay awake all night and we sleep during the day we have allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَجَعَنَّ اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسَ allah says i have made the night a covering a time of rest but you see many youth today they spend their nights watching television. They're out hanging out together. And during the day, they're burning the daylight with their sleep. This was not the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. There's a reason why many youth today, they're not able to wake up for a fajr. Because they don't sleep. They don't sleep properly at night. Rasulullah used to sleep at night. The reason why he's able to pray Salatul Layl and Salatul Fajr is because the Holy Prophet used to sleep shortly after Salatul Isha. Many of our great ulama who used to offer the night prayers on a regular basis, they used to sleep early. Shaheed Mutahari, for example, he had a schedule. 10 p.m. he would sleep every night and he would wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning. The only way that you can wake up that early is if you go to bed early. Imam Zain al-Abideen, speaking about the calmness and the tranquility that the night brings, Imam Zain al-Abideen, he says, Tazawwaj bil-layl, fa'innahu ju'ila laylu sakana. Imam Zain al-Abideen, he says, don't only rest at night, but get married at night. Do your nikah at night why because the imam says allah has made night sakanan a time of rest and allah has made marriage what do we read in the quran women ayati and khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan litaskunu ilayha marriage brings sakina it brings tranquility to the human being so 
conduct your marriage ceremony at night because in the same way that night is a time of tranquility your marriage is meant to mirror the tranquility and the serenity of night and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has made the sun and the moon for reckoning time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be conscious of time Allah has created these celestial bodies for us to keep track of time to be people of discipline to be individuals who prioritize who are good at time management the nature of the the precision of the sun and the moon is an invitation to discipline if these inanimate objects are able to be precise and exact in their movements we human beings also have to be people of discipline and time management and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final ayah in ayah number 97 he says وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ النُّجُومَ لِتَهْتَدُوا بِهَا فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ قَدْ فَصَّلْنَا الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah says it is he who made for you the stars that which you might be guided by them amid the darkness of land and sea we have expounded the signs for people who know one of the functions of the stars Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you are able to navigate when you when you don't when the sun and the moon are taken away you still have the stars to guide you at night now before GPS generations millions of people throughout history the way that they would move about the earth they would use the stars as their GPS Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says amid that darkness when the Sun would set if the moon was covered you would be able to find your path using the stars even when Allah takes away the sun and the moon he still has a mechanism for our guidance now does that also remind you of something when Allah takes away the sun and the moon there are still the stars that can guide us when Allah Azza wa Jal takes away Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib there are still there is still a system of guidance this is why Rasulullah says in the hadith that the stars are a safe haven there are security for the inhabitants of the earth especially those who are traveling by sea it protects them from drowning from losing their way at sea And the Prophet says, And my Ahlul Bayt are also a security for my Ummah from deviation. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahineen. If there are any questions or comments, we can take some questions. When I looked at ayah number 93 today, I knew we weren't going to be able to cover very many verses. <laughs> so I have a question, Sheikh. This is not directly about the uh, Anam. But it's about Abasa, which you mentioned. Sure. Uh, here, the the um, person that is being addressed in the ayah is a man because it says Zaljati. I think after uh, that, the the man is gonna forget his wife. 
is there a reason why Allah chose to address the male and not the female? Or is that just a language construct in Arabic? Ahsan, it's a very good question. Now, when the Quran mentions يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي This is, this is a, it's, it's a language construct because mar can also refer to, to female. So in, in the same way where Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ He uses the word rijal. But in that context, it also includes women. So here, if you want to, if you want to look at it, look at the verse, uh, you know, according to its intended meaning, the ayah is basically saying that on the day of judgment, because even akhi, akh, akh means brother. Does that mean oh, your, your sisters are not going to be neglected? It means sibling. So on the day of judgment, man, male or female, will run away from his siblings, his mother, father, spouse, and children. Why? Because everyone will be preoccupied. So this is a, uh, a, uh, a language construct. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about a specific gender. Yeah, the, the, the thing that confused me was because it, it specifically said sahib but bihi, and the ta means female. So, wife instead of spouse. Why sahibah is used specifically? Uh, yeah, I, I would have to. I would have to look that up off the top of my head. I really can't comment. It's, a, it's an excellent observation, but my question would be, and again, I would have to also research this myself. Don't you think that the the order is interesting? So look at the order of the verse. Siblings are mentioned first. Mother, father, wife, and children. So maybe that's your homework for next week. Why is the order in this way? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning the least so Allah is mentioning the most dear people to you typically but as Allah beginning by the least dear and progressing towards the most dear because you would imagine that your children are the most dear to you and maybe your siblings are the least Allah so maybe that's maybe that's your homework for next week <laughs> I'm pretty good. I haven't given you a single homework assignment. This is your first. Uh, Sheikh, one question. Uh, you mentioned that the Prophet would sleep early and a lot of the ulama would sleep early. Uh, there are a lot of other hadiths I've heard which talk about people staying awake late at night worshipping and not and yeah, staying, awake, staying awake at night. So like, how does that kind of contrast with this? Now, when we say that they stay awake at night, late at night. You have to understand that during the time of the Prophet, there's no electricity, right? So Maghrib and Isha is the beginning of the night. So if say say Maghrib and Isha, say Maghrib is at eight or nine o'clock. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa does his Isha prayer, he may stay awake for about an hour and then sleeps. Say ten to one or ten to two three, four hours of rest, or even more than that. If you wake up at three, four in the morning, you still have a good portion of the night to, uh, to offer prayers. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, um, there were definitely some nights in which the Prophet would dedicate the entire night for worship. But typically, the Prophet would spend a portion of the night. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Holy Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet. Let me look up the verse real quick. Surah Al-Muzzammil. Ya ayyuhal-Muzzammil. 
قم الليل إلا قليلا نصفه أو انقص منه قليلا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Prophet, O you who have wrapped, who are who have wrapped up in your garments, rise to pray in the night except a little. So a portion of it, leave it for sleep. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes, when the hadith rebuke people who stay awake at night, there's actually a hadith about, about this. That staying awake at night is, is this light, discouraged. Unless you're engaged in the recitation of Quran, unless you're doing, you're offering prayers, or you're being intimate with your spouse. Other than that, you don't have a very good reason to be awake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't condemn someone for staying awake and sacrificing their sleep for the sake of their ibadah. But even with Night worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants us to be moderate. I mean, because if, if you don't sleep any night, you're going to damage your health. And that's going to that's gonna inhibit your ability to offer salatul late in the future, especially if, if you develop a health problem. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, dedicate a portion of the night for, for ibadah. And this was the, the sunnah of the Prophet. If you look at the biography of the Prophet, He used to... He used to divide his time into three parts. Spiritual development, his ibadah, his alone time with Allah in the form of prayers and nawafil. And then he had family time. He would spend with his family, with his wives. And then he had community time, his societal responsibilities. So he would div divide his time into those three areas. Spiritual, spiritual development, Family affairs, community affairs. Thank you. I have a question about word choice as well. In sure. In Ayah 93, um, it, uh, the angels say, you shall receive, I mean, the, your translation was slightly different from the one I have, but it says, you shall receive your reward, a penalty of shame. And I was wondering what, like if there's any significance to the fact that it's called a reward. I think you translated it as we will award you a punishment of shame. So your I number 93, let me look at the 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 so, Arabic, so in, in Arabic Tujzawna. Al Yawma Tujzawna Adab. Yeah it, Perhaps the because uh, I was relying on uh, on, a, on a translation that yeah awarded is ne not necessarily the the right word because jaza could uh, could be negative or could be positive jaza could be a, a reward or it can be a punishment so so you, you will be compensated so jaza is essentially compensation you're compensated by it with reward or you're compensated with punishment. I, I think that, that's a good point. I, I think awarded is not the, not, not the right uh, English word. Perhaps recompensed or compensated is more accurate. Thank you. Uh, Sheikh, uh, in verse 94, at the end, uh, had, it said something along the lines of, uh, and your fancies have left you in the lurch. Uh, what, what was it talking about, like, oh, uh, fancies in that case, or that it left you in the lurch? I number 94? Yes, the very last part of it. So after it says, it, it has all been severed between you and lost from you, is that which, what you used to claim? Yeah. So, if we assume that the audience, Allah is speaking about these disbelievers. They, the claim that they were making was that their idols, their false deities would, would provide them protection, that they're associates, that they would in some way receive protection from their tribes, from these false gods, these false deities. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that 
it has all been severed between you and lost from you is what you used to claim the claim that you will have these idols or these false deities or false authorities whatever it may be these things that you took as objects of shirk that they would come to your rescue that you would that they would fail you essentially so and, and the quran actually mentions in several verses that these false idols these false deities these these false authorities will disown and forsake you on the day of judgment so the things that you relied on for protection in this life will not come to your rescue on that day thank you thank you very much this is uh, really informative as always Thanks May Allah bless you guys, and uh, inshallah we will continue uh, next week. Inshallah. inshallah. Thank you, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.